Okay. Hi, folks. Um, I'm told this is an English-speaking crowd. Is that correct? correct? More or less? Right? Any non-English speakers in the crowd? We're, we're okay. Okay. Nice to see you. Okay. It's a thrill to be here. Uh, my name is David Foreman. I'll be speaking just a little bit about Aleph Beta, just so I get a chance and, and figure out this presentation a little bit. How many of you folks already have some familiarity with Aleph Beta? Okay. Sounds good. Um, so, uh, I only have about 25 minutes with you. What I think I'm going to do is just give you a, a little bit of a brief sense of, of what Aleph Beta is, where I was coming from um, in developing it, and then show you a little bit of it and talk about some opportunities about how you could use it. Um, Aleph Beta began, I, I guess, in, in my head about, uh, well, to some extent, you know, 20 years ago, but the technology wasn't there. And the technology became there uh, in, in a way that I could use it about you know, seven to five years ago or so. Um, I'd always been interested in developing material on Tanakh, but the issue always was how do you make this available to people and to teachers in a way that it can be useful for them. Once upon a time, I developed a lot of material in my own ivory tower and put it out in teacher guides, which I assiduously wrote, and found that it was impossible to really, or it wasn't impossible, but it, it wasn't particularly useful to people. It needed to come alive in some way. And hence the idea of interactive, these interactive videos uh, was born. Um, Aleph Beta uses animation um, to uh, talk about sophisticated things, um, which leads to a kind of, uh, a kind of oxymoron, or a, a little bit, which is that its audience is very wide. On the one hand, the audience is uh, sophisticated adults, people who've learned in yeshiva and kolel for many years. And on the other hand, there's middle schoolers who uh, can barely speak Hebrew, who are in sixth grade, who are, who are clicking on it because the cartoons uh, will, draw them, will draw them in. The experience of working with Aleph Beta um, actually has changed my view of children, actually, and children's intelligence. Um, uh, one of these days in the next world, I'd love to have a conversation with Piaget about this. But what I would say for the meantime is that um, the difference between kids and adults, I think, is not so much that adults are smarter than kids. Adult, kids are pretty smart. I think the great difference between adults and kids is life experience. We've been around longer. What does life experience do for you? It does a lot of things to do for you, but one of the things it does, I think, is that intellectually it gives you a library of concepts, almost a visual library of concepts. Just to say, like, if somebody explains a complicated new idea to you, your m mind can kind of break down that idea and say, oh, okay, I get it. There's three ideas here. There's this idea, that idea, and that idea. I've encountered each of these ideas before. I have a little mind picture of that idea. I can put my little mind picture of these three ideas together, and I understand what you're talking about. Kids don't have that vocabulary because they, the, they don't have the life experience to have built all those mind pictures, so it's harder for them to deal with sophisticated ideas. But what I found, you know, a fascinating thing, I'm giving a class one day, and this woman comes over and says, I want to tell you a funny story about my fifth grader. So I said, what happened? And she says, well, a few nights ago, she uh, asked me if, she, if it was okay if she could watch some videos that she found on the internet on Purim. They were my videos. So she said, sure. So she watches them. An hour and a half later, she's still watching. So she says, you know, what was going on? I'm just watching these videos, Ma. The next day, she's in class in Besiakov somewhere in Borough Park. And the teacher asks, did anybody hear anything interesting on the Megillah lately? She raises her hand and delivers a perfect 12-minute summary of the videos that she watched. And her teacher is floored and says, where did, you, where did you get that from? And so she said, well, you know, it was a video. So she came home and told her mom about it. Her mom said, but how did you remember it all? She said, Mom, it's a video, right? <laughs> so there's something about video. And it, what video does is it, it, I think it, it gives the kids the pictures, right? So if the kids don't have the pictures, here's the pictures. And then you all of a sudden, you can swim in very sophisticated concepts that you before sort of haven't had access to. Um, what I'm trying to do with, with Aleph Beta, Aleph Beta is a site which deals uh, mostly with Tanakh and Chumash. It organizes ideas around typically the holidays and, uh, and uh, the and Parshiyot HaShavua. Um, we'll, be, we'll be adding to that uh, this coming year, but pretty much that's the organization um, of the site. More or less, the videos are about 10 minutes long in length or so. The, some of them are a little bit longer, and then the holiday ones are longer. They're about an hour long. Um, the, 
methodology um, is an interesting blend of art and science. It starts with what I would call science and then it goes off into what I would call art. Um, uh, personally, speaking personally, I believe that what God wants from us when we learn actually really is bringing those two things together. The science of it is that when we learn, what we're learning has to be grounded, it has to be real. The science keeps you from just making up your own stuff, right? Pontificating, making up fluff, um, right? If I'm talking about fluff, then it's, it's not really coming from the text. It's not God talking, it's not the Torah talking, it's you talking, and you're just hanging little things on the text, but it's not really coming from you. The science is necessary so that you're actually developing right, a, a cogent argument of what the text really is trying to tell me. But science only takes you so far. There's a lot of evidence. The question is, and even in a scientific, uh, even when you're doing scientific work in biology and chemistry, the same thing is true. There is a point where a scientist has to stand back and ask themselves, what does all of this evidence mean? Right? When I take all of, the, all of these indications and I put them together, what does it mean? And at this point, even the, heart, the most objective, hardened scientist brings themselves to, to what it is they're studying and say, this is what it means to me. This is the theory I want to suggest. This is how I see it coming together. This is the most conservative way I see it coming together. And this is what it means to me. Um, Einstein did that, right? others did that, and that's the element of art. And when you do that, to some extent, you are bringing yourself to the text. You're bringing your own personal life to the text and saying, this is how it resonates with me. This is what it means to me. That's basically what I'm doing with these videos. Um, and I'm inviting the watcher or, uh, to come along on the journey with me. Um, it, the best way to describe it is a kind of guided journey, a kind of guided archaeological dig about something you're really excited in where you're trying to recreate a journey that you took for someone else, uh, but also let somebody else interact with the journey in a way that they can be critical about it, in a way that they can, they can uh, think with their own head and perhaps even come to, to different conclusions. What am I hoping to achieve by putting these videos out? I'll show you a little, uh, a video or a little snippet from a video or two. Um, I guess the best way to think about that would be to describe to you a little story um, that I uh, that happened to me, an actual story. Um, this story took place uh, in Woodmere um, in a salad store where I was munching on a salad and try, try, trying to remain obscure when somebody noticed me and said, hi, are you Roy Foreman? Can I sit and chat with you for a moment? So I said, sure, chat away. So he says, well, I don't daven at your shul, I daven at the shul across the street. <laughs> and I have this guy who sits there next, next to me. And the guy wears a black hat and he looks like you and me, he looks like everybody else, but I've talked to him, I'm telling you, there's nothing inside, he's lost everything. He's, he's orthodox in, in, in behavior only. Inside, uh, nothing is left. He's not really Shomer Shabbos, he doesn't believe anything, but he loves his wife and doesn't want to divorce her and lose his kids, so he sends his kids to day school and keeps up appearances, but there's, you know, there's no moon left inside, there's nothing left inside. What, what, what should I tell this guy? What, what would you, how would you talk to him? So I'm looking at this fellow talking to me, and I'm not sure if he's talking about the guy who sits next to him in shul or if he's talking about himself, you know? <laughs> and, and the question is, what do you say to someone like that? And I don't know what I would say to someone like that. Certainly in the Hillel, you know, teach me the entire Torah while you stand on one foot sort of mode. But what I would say is that if I could have talked to that guy five years ago, right, here's what I, what, what I would have tried to do is sort of learn with him. When we think about Kirov, we think about enriching the spirituality of, of, it doesn't matter who, when we think about it, of cure of the people who aren't orthodox, we try to draw them in, or if we think about people who are, or, or our own students who've grown up in, in from homes, we think about what does it mean to, um, uh, to bring spirituality into their lives. I find that there's, there's kind of an interesting dichotomy there, which is that, you know, years ago I used to speak in the Gateway Seminars, which were these you know, big cure of seminars. And what I found was that it was almost as if the Torah was being treated like a black box, which is to say there's this thing called the Torah. Let's call it X. We won't really do any X with you. We won't really learn much about X, but I'm going to go and try to convince you that X is true. 
So here are all these reasons why you should believe that X is true and why X was, was given by God. And if I can show that enough, you're, then you're going to have to believe in X. What is X? Whatever X is, you'll learn that when you go to yeshiva, right? But that is, that's the Kirov process. There's an entirely different way to think about that process, which is forget about all those proofs, forget about understanding why it is that, you know, God, I don't know who wrote it, whether God wrote it, other people wrote it, but this is our book. Let's learn the book together. And if you learn the book together and you can learn in such a way that you can begin to open up the layers of the book, something special happens. Um, and that something special is what I'm trying to capture in these videos. I would sort of break that something special down to kind of like three elements. The three elements are pretty much these. Element number one, there are certain tools that you can use when looking at the text, very powerful tools, that can begin to show somebody that the book that you're looking, is not, that you're looking at is not a regular book. It's a different book. It's not like Shakespeare. It's not like Chaucer. It's, it's got its own system, and it's very, very sophisticated, very elegant, and very beautiful. There's layers like an onion, and you can actually see the layers. You don't have to believe that there are layers. They're looking at these tools. You can actually see the layers, and you can, just, and you can actually see it. And it's funny because the really amazing things in this world are things that you can discover but can't really replicate. For example, with trillions of dollars of medical research, you can discover how the body works but very hard to replicate it, right? You can discover a womb, you can figure it out, but for all the money that we have, we can't yet build an artificial womb. What does it do? It holds a baby, right? But just to be able to do that, much less an artificial human being, you can't even replicate it. It's the same thing with the Torah. Once you begin to see what's there, you can discover what's there, you can begin to see what's there, but if you had to put together a book with the layers of sophistication that exist, right? It's breathtaking. You wouldn't be able to do it. It's just, it, it begins to seem like it's not humanly possible to do. So number one is discovery. Using special tools, literary tools, can you begin to see why this book is different? Can you begin to see the layers, the striking layers of meaning that are hidden on the document? Step two is, you can then realize that that which, that which I'm discovering my connection to it is not based, and this is a very important question that you kind of ask, ask when you teach, why should your students believe anything, you say, right? There's basically two answers to that question. One is authority and the other is their own minds. Authority is, well, I have a long beard, I went to such and such a school and I learned by such and such a person and I can raise my voice, right? And I can intimidate you and I can tell you that if you don't listen to me, you're going to burn in hell or I can imply that, right? So it, I can do things to sort of intimidate you and I can do things to call upon my authority or my charisma or whatever it is and say that's why you should believe me. But there's another reason which is now I can talk softly and I can just be whoever I am, but I can be your guide and I can show you how to use your own mind to approach something and how to be astounded with something with your own mind. And when I do that, I'm actually empowering kids. I'm helping them see that with their own head, right, they can begin to grasp this thing and be able to see meaning in it, which is actually revolutionary and transformative. Think about a lot of the things that we do in school. When a lot of things that we do is we um, is we teach our students about very smart people in the past, whether those smart people were Rashi or whether they were the Rashbam or whether they were the Ezra or whether they're, they're the Hamak Dover. There's all these people, and if you're a sixth grader or a seventh grader or a ninth grader, and you have all these people, and then there's little old me, who am I really, right? I'm very little and I'm very meek, and all I can do is sit at the footsteps of these people and drink their wisdom, and that's fine, but if God gave us this book, Maybe he gave us this book because everybody is supposed to also be able to use their head and connect to it and to powerfully draw spirituality from it and to be able to engage the book with their own brain. And if we can't teach our kids to do that, we're missing out on the ability to reach across time, to connect to that book with their own brain and to begin to say, wow, I'm a part of this. And the kind of experience you get that you can, that you can achieve when you do that with a kid it's kind of like why we bring kids to Israel and we have them do archaeology digs where they can find this Hashmonai coin with their own hand and feel this I got with my own hand and I'm here and I'm reaching across and I'm part of Jewish history and I'm connected to something that's so much larger to myself and it's the history of the Jewish people, 10 minutes, the history of the Jewish people and it's the history and it's, and it's, and it's Israel and it's something so much bigger to ourselves. Well, it's true, but the thing that's so much bigger and more wonderful than ourselves is 
isn't just Israel, and it isn't just Jewish history, but it's the book too, right? It's the Torah itself. So number two is, number one is, can you see that the book is different than every other book? Can you see that with your own mind, you can see why that's true? You don't have to trust anybody. You can really, really see it with your own head. And step number three in the three-step process is once you see that, once you begin to use these tools to uncover meaning of the book, once you see that you can do it yourself, you can also begin to see that stories which seemed abstruse and arcane and which seemed to have nothing to do with you actually jump to life in powerful ways and mean things to me in my very own life in striking ways. Once you can see all of that, then what you've done, back to my guy with the salad store, right, is you've transformed somebody's relationship with Torah, right? Then they're in it, they're in the game, it means something to them, they're on the journey, and you know, what if you could create a society of people like that, people who had that kind of connection to Torah? That, that changes everything. So Alephate's attempt to try to distill that into, uh, into, um, uh, into uh, uh, some videos. Let me show you this little two minute video over here and then I'll wrap up with, uh, in just a couple minutes. I think often in education we think of educating and inspiring our kids as two different things. What if we could create a kind of education where inspiring and educating our kids was the same thing? Where you looked at text and you looked at our heritage and the more you understood about it, the more inspired you got until you were just on fire. There was no difference between educating and inspiring your kids. Wouldn't that be the kind of education we want to create? That's really the kind of vision that powers us at Aleph Beta. What's been great for me in using these, the platform of Aleph Beta is that as a teacher, I have a partner in preparing my classes. That the curriculum is made for me. The video is made for me. And as a teacher, now I can take what Rabbi Foreman is teaching and incorporate it with my own style, take the parts I like, take the parts that I think would work for my students, and teach it over to them. What's so uniquely important is the skill set that he teaches these kids. He teaches this, you know, his famous lullaby effect that we look at something and, and we just take it for granted, but would we really look at it, how we would think? And that's an amazing skill set that these kids have really, really mastered. One of the things I love about teaching, uh, especially in the middle school, is you teach a lot of the same halakha and the same themes about the that they've been learning since they were much younger, even in first grade. But you're trying to take it a little bit further. You're trying to teach them on a deeper level. And what Aleph Beta does is it inspires the students to be able to ask questions about what they've already learned to really explore deeper. One of the things we're focused on Aleph Beta is trying to create material that is relevant to students at a particular time, a particular time of year. So we're focused on creating Parsha videos, we're focused on creating holiday videos. One time I was asking a student about the Mishkan, and a lot of the students said, ah, we don't really know much about the Mishkan, we don't really want to know about the Mishkan. And after the video, those same students who were, you know, trying to look around and see if they can get out of class were completely enthralled with the video and they were, you know, watching and they had their hand raised and they wanted to learn more. As teachers, that's those are the moments you look for, those aha moments when you see the kids face that finally this makes sense and this this is, you know, enjoyable. They look at something and they look at it differently. They don't just accept it because it says it. They look at it, they think about it. Or my foreman loves when we comment and disagree with them or say that we we had a different idea that the, the curriculum is here for us to be a jumping off point. One of the exciting things is when you get comments on our website from teachers and from schools where they say, hey, this is really fantastic, but you know, we thought of this and you might not have thought of that. And they're right, I didn't think of that. If you think about what Torah Shabbat Pet really is, it's not meant to be written down. It's meant to be a dynamic kind of process, a process of back and forth between uh, between teacher and student, where there is really no difference between teacher and student. Teacher becomes student, and student becomes teacher. I think often. Okay, so that's it pretty much. Uh, I'll give you a little flavor of it. Um, if you go to the site itself, I'll just uh, give you a 10 second tool around. This is what Aleph Beta looks like. They're animated videos. Here's like just the beginning of a first one here. 
This is Rabbi David Foreman, and welcome to Parshat Kitetze. You are watching Alf Beta. The Torah tells us to honor our parents. Why? Well, if we had to speculate, the most obvious answer is our parents gave us the greatest gift of all, life itself. So, obviously, some deference is due to them when we honor them. We are doing the least we can to those who've given us life. That, I think, is the conventional interpretation of why it is that we honor our parents, and I don't mean to argue with it here, but speaking personally, I myself have recently come to perceive a new wrinkle in why it is that we honor our parents, something that, at least for me, makes the mix of jump to life in a whole new way, and I want to share it with you. The insight came from something in this week's Parsha that seems to have very little indeed to do with honoring your parents. So I'm going to invite you to forget everything I told you for a moment about honoring your parents and just focus on this week's Parsha and then we'll come back to our parents and kind of tie it all together. Our Parsha contains the famous mitzvah of Shilua Hakan, sending away a mother bird. The way the Torah phrases it, so this is a video on Shiloh Hakan. What you'll find is an Aleph Beta. We have videos about 10 minutes long. This is about 12 minutes, which would exceed the time I have with you left. Um, and uh, you'll find three Parsha videos for every Parsha. So you have a wealth of material here. You'll also find five full-length holiday movies, which run for an hour, right, on each of the holidays. Um, so it's really a tremendous amount of material. I want to close, and if I have uh, time for one or two questions, that's fine. If not, then you can accost me in the hallway. Um, but uh, I just close by telling you that one of the things we're doing uh, this year is we're going, we're trying a kind of grand experiment, uh, which is we are, um, uh, most of our, well, uh, w what we're doing is we are making Aleph Beta free, actually, for teachers. Um, so this is a new thing. First time I'm actually announcing the public is right here, right? So thank you. Um, so uh, you have the ability to sign in and create your own free account, which will give you access to our entire library. You can show it in class. You can use it. Uh, we will also be rolling out a premium thing, which you can pay for, which will give you things like teacher, uh, uh, teacher guides and worksheets for your students and ideas about how to use this in the classroom for each of our videos. We have those professionally produced by educators. They'll also give you sheets which you can print out based upon the videos that kids can use for Shabbos learning around the table with their, with their parents and family. They'll also give you access to teacher training webinars with me. But that's another thing, you can sign up for that, but the free account is yours to have. To sign up for it, uh, um, the, uh, it's just a Google form, uh, which will give you a coupon code, which should be active by tomorrow. Uh, but the, the, the way you get to the Google form is with a bit.ly, if you've ever used bit.ly before. So bit.ly's go like this, bit dot L-Y forward slash AB sign up. But there's only one problem the A in AB sign up has to be capitalized or it will bring you to some other site. I take no responsibility for the other site. So one more time, it's bit.ly, bit, B-I-T dot L-Y, right? I would write this out for you, but um, I can try, try to write it on the screen. B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash capital A, right? A-B sign up, A-B for Aleph Beta, A-B sign up, one word, right? That will take you to a Google form. Fill out the Google form, and then at the end of that, you'll get a coupon code, which you can use tomorrow to sign up for your free account, for your complimentary account. And we'd appreciate it if you stay in touch with us. We'd like to hear how it goes with you and your students and, and, and be your partners. Yeah? Let's say I'm already signed up. So if you're already signed up, you have the chance of either keeping your account and getting access to the premium features, or you can downgrade to the free account, but you'll lose those other features. With our current premium accounts, you also get free account, you also get accounts for your kids that won't exist in the complimentary accounts, but with the premium accounts, you'll get accounts for so your kids also. Teacher courses, would that be part of the premium accounts? Yes, the teacher courses are part of the premium account. Mm -hmm. Can you put some yeah. samples of the teacher stuff in the free accounts so we can have a chunk of what it is? Uh, that's a good idea. Maybe what we'll do is we'll send you guys, um, so we'll email, once we have you signed up, when, somewhere after your welcome email, after a couple of weeks, we'll give you a, uh, a sample of some of those and we'll show you what it is. So we'll try to entice you to move on to premium. Thank you for, thank you for the marketing example over there. Anyway, nice seeing you.
Okay, and then I'll be around for the next couple of days, so you're free to accost me in the hallways. Tomorrow? What are you talking about tomorrow? So I'm, I'm speaking on Wednesday. You're welcome to come. Actually, it's, it's officially closed, but don't mind that. Just come. Um, and I'm speaking, it's called The Secret of the Kruvim, Creation and the Mishkan, and the interaction between the creation story, the six days of creation and the Mishkan, and also basically just as a, a scientific person in the 21st century, how do you read the six days of creation in a way that makes sense? So that's uh, on Wednesday in the Ulam Smachot. You guys are invited to come there. Also speaking in Ranana, by the way, Tuesday night, if you want to come at 8 o'clock, I'm doing the most mysterious story in Shmos, uh, Moshan Sipora at the Inn at Beit Matan, 8 o'clock in Ranana. So you're welcome to come there too. Thank you, David. Okay. I'm Smadar Goldstein. This is uh, Stan Fearless. We work together. Stan, you want to wave? Smile and wave. Uh, we founded JET to, in 2009. We train teachers. We've trained thousands of teachers all over the world in educational technology. And that's what we're here to talk to you about today. This is interactive, so please, if you have a device or a phone, put this link, uh, HTTPS, this tiny, you could just write tinyurl.com slash Herzog Jets. You can please type that into any device that you have right now. Because we are hopefully good. I'll make it bigger. Tiny, this one, tinyurl.com slash Herzog Jets. That one. I can't make it bigger. You could just type that in. Our goal here is to show you an enrichment program for Shmuel Bet. Does anyone teach Shmuel Bet? Yay. Anyone want to teach Shmuel Bet? <laughs> anyone ever planning on teaching Shmuel Bet? Or if you ever mention the words David HaMelech in your class, or if you ever want to mention the words David HaMelech in your class, this enrichment program is appropriate for you. It is for grades approximately six and up. Uh, I wouldn't go past nine. Uh, and it is a sample that we built together with Herzog College on using uh, educational technology and ways to improve and show different ways to increase engagement in the classroom using both Israel as a resource and a very active student engagement. How many of you are on this document right now? Show of hands. Okay, well, so a couple more. So we're going to go through uh, three tools today. Please feel free to jump in at any time and ask questions as long as we are on target to get through all three tools. Okay, so I'm going to start this. Stan, do you want to say anything? No. Okay, here we go. So if you please also help each other out because I'm going to go off the screen right now. You can take this handout. The handout, as you can see, goes over a bunch of different features that we have uh, for the program. It focuses on collaborative learning, multisensory instruction, higher order thinking skills, and interactive online tools. So you could just take this and look around. So the first uh, collaborative tool that we would say is this is like, whoops, like I said, this is a uh, enrichment program. So assuming that your students have already learned about a little bit about David Hamelech, and it is now right before uh, Shaul dies, and he has a difficult life, as you would say. You would go take your students onto this Padlet. If you clicked on the word collaborative learning in the document, again, I'll go back here, right here. Sorry, this is where it takes me if I click whatever it is. Okay, I'll help you in a second. If you click, if you're on this document and you click where it says collaborative, mm -hmm. how many of you can do that? One person? Please help each other. So again, you typed in tinyurl.com slash herjobjets, then you get on this document, click on the word collaborative. Okay, and again, this is not the first day of class. This is something you would do to enrich during class. Can I help anyone get on? You were looking at a Padlet. You just have to click on the top. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. How many of you are on the Padlet right now? Great. So if you're on the Padlet, you need to decide now. <laughs> we have already created a video about David Hamelf, but because I have right now about 21 minutes to show a tremendous amount of curriculum, I am skipping around and assuming I'm going with your adult knowledge about David. If this was in class, we would go much slower, obviously. Uh, there is a video that we have created about David. There is uh, additional background information with pictures and images and everything. Like I said, I am skipping and I'm trusting right now your adult knowledge. So we have seen a video about David, we know a little bit about his life, and we have arrived at this Padlet. Please, if you're on the Padlet, enjoy, engage in it. How do you do that? You need to see. Which character traits do you see? Here are some samples, both in Hebrew and English. And you need to look at each column and say, which character trait would you feel describes David? You click the plus sign underneath the column that you're looking at, and you type in the character trait that you feel best describes David. 
in Hebrew or in English. You can also scroll down each individual column. You see right here through these little scroll down buttons. Each column has its own scroll down. And please do this while I walk. We call it walk while you talk. Do it while I do it with you. I want this to be interactive. You guys are way too quiet. Very well behaved for seventh grade. You're on a laptop and an iPad, correct? Uh, press the plus. Scrolling. The scrolling. Yeah. As you can see, it already answers there. This was already piloted with students across the United States, Panama, Israel, Canada, and the student. The responses that you see are from students that did this together. We had some Israeli students learning with American students, not at the same exact time, but the same week, and they would go on and see each other's posts. You can't get on. Um, which one? Your phone. Tinyurl.com. Uh, did anybody post anything? Yeah. <laughs> okay, can you tell me what you posted? I wrote the word brave under David yeah. and Goliath. Thank you. And why do you feel that way? Because he was like a fighter. Because <laughs> he was a little boy fighting a big giant. How many of us would do that? Not me. <laughs> right. Um, prior to anybody else? I mean, I don't know how much I have to write. I wrote David Amit Meod. That's great. And why did you feel that way? <laughs> okay, we all went for the violence. Just says a lot about us. Just saying. Um, great. Uh, did anybody find anything that anybody else wrote and was inspired by another student from another location? And we do not know who that student is right now. That's fine. So here you are. You want to click right there on the word collaborative, and then you want to click right there on that. How many have used Padlet before? We don't even know Padlet. Have you used it in this way? Pictures, columns, character traits, descriptive, collaborative, how have you used it? So here's the path. Usually more with comments than with editing. Just wait for it to load. Usually you use more with what? Comments than editing the individual pair with the boxes underneath, let's say, the list. And what's your impression of using it like this? I like it You like it better? Score one. Anybody else? I have a question. Yeah. How long does something like this take you to make? To make. For me personally, not too long because I've been doing this now for a very long time. But what we also do at Jets is we train other teachers how to use it. We teach eight week online courses called No Teacher Left Behind. And each week we throw, if that's what it's called, we are on cohort 27. We have cohort 28 starting in the fall. We throw about three of these uh, tools at you every week. And it's interactive. The webinar is like now. Even though we're online, we're all in different places. I have people hopefully joining from. South Africa, Mexico, and of course the United States of America in the next cohort. And I will post this Padlet in the chat box. You would click on it, we would do it, you would ask questions, how did you do this? Where do I get these images from? And then the webinar takes that flow. Uh, all the resources that we use are hosted on a private and secure website. Once you are not used to it, it takes a while, not gonna lie, but then you get used to it. And how much time do you spend preparing whatever you spend preparing? A while, right? The benefit of this is what? Can I use it again? Yes. No problem. Uh, there is a button of, I can use it again, I can share it with others. There's even, uh, what does that say? He's Khabrut, I'm not wearing my glasses. Join. She, uh, join, yes. In English, if you have it in English, it'll say remake. On any of your screens, does it say remake? If you press that right now, this Padlet will now go into it. Says log in. If you log in and you have an account and you press remake, I'm, tell, I'm allowing you to steal my information. This is a one-time deal only. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Because this, is, this program is collaborated with Herzog, so I don't share curriculum, but I will allow this group to take only this one. You press remake, it's in your account. You can now remove some things, add what you want. It goes with the comments or without the comments? You can decide. You can go in and delete them, and that's a feature of Padlet. So each webinar has all those discussions. We're going to have one comment from you, a comment from Stan, then we're going to move on to tool number two. Yes, go ahead. Get your hand up. No. Stan? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, this can be used in class. If students have devices, it also can be used as, as homework. So students can start working together collaboratively even when they're not in the classroom. This is a mindset activity at the beginning of Shmuel Vet to get them to review a little bit of Shmuel Alec and to think about what, what are some of the and when we teach how to use these things, we have rules. I never post these things without pictures. So if you scroll up, you'll see there are images uh, for each one. Because as we just heard from Rabbi Foreman, what does an image do? to your mind, oops, 
um, okay, to get this going. You can use this for obviously a lot of different tools. We're going to move on to the next tool. And that, so again, you're going back now to your Google Doc. Mm -hmm. The next tool, you're right here, it says Interactive Online Tools. If you could click on that, please. Interactive Online Tools. And you get to this, which is a poll. Anybody ever use poll everywhere? In class. Thank you. Ellie, can I? Where have you used it? Okay. Uh, vote. Don't wait for me. If you're on that, just choose the one you want. Now that Shaul has died, what do you think David will do next? The point of this is to get the student to pause. We know what David did next, but if we look back at his life, we see that he really had extremely difficult dilemmas as a leader to choose from, much as many of our leaders have today. What would have been the right thing to do? What did he do? And we're trying to get our students to sit and have a reflective pause on his life and also take a look at their lives. Critical decisions we make, our parents make, our leaders make. What do things happen in our schools, in our communities, in our classrooms? We're trying to draw those parallels to David. You should be voting. Did anyone vote? I did remake some kind of stuff. What? I said I remade your Padlet, so I'm a little stuck. I'm you remade it? No, I did remake, as you said. Oh, from Padlet. Yes, oh, yeah, it'll part. take a minute. <laughs> uh, this is, okay. What? You should. Oh. It's not coming up. Uh, poll everywhere always gives me trouble. Well, knowing the story is really none of the above. None of them. None of the above. He asks the same. What should I do? Okay, but what could he have done? Okay, this is. He can't wait for Shmuel to provide directions. Right. This, if I didn't have 23 minutes, um, it does tabulate polls, but I need to log in and I don't want to take the time. But it does tabulate the polls that everybody voted. How many voted for declare himself king? So it would tabulate that. I need to log in. I don't want to take the time to do that. How many voted for the second one? Wait for Shmuel to provide directions. Oh, a bunch of those. And how many <laughs> waited to see what the people... <laughs> and how many, <laughs> how many wanted to wait to see what the people wanted him to do who voted for that one? Okay, so in a live class, this would be lively, tab, uh, live, living and tabulating as people go along. You can also reduce an answer and put in an answer, and it's a lot of fun for kids. Okay, we're going to move on to the last tool, so please keep scrolling down your page, going back to the handout. I know I'm going fast. I apologize if I lose any of you. I'm only doing this because I am pressed for time. You realize in a normal class, I would obviously go a lot slower. Uh, meaningful connections. If you scroll down, you're looking at this cute little picture of history repeats itself. Right next to that, there's something called meaningful connections. Uh, you are look How do you sign up for that poll? Polleverywhere.com. It's free. And they have all these really cool different features that you can use. One word answered, wordles, prioritizing. Super cool. You can do it in a class, in an audience, with parents. Recommend it for parent night as well. Uh, this is called ThingLink. How many of you have ever heard or seen of a thing link? Ruben, where were? Thing link because it links things. Okay, thing link because it links things. Uh, we have a paid for version. If you are an educator, they have a very good discount. It's thirty-five dollars a year, not so much money. Ask your schools, pay for it. The goal of this slide is just looking at it. This is in lesson uh, six. These are seven. This whole program is seven lessons, and we've now skipped from lesson one to lesson three. And this is now in lesson six. So again, we're skipping around. We're moving fast because of all the reasons I've already mentioned. Uh, what do you think this is? Just looking at the images and the pictures, what do you think this is telling you? OK, and we have to fight. Look at all the times that we have to fight for Yerushalayim. For Yerushalayim. OK, and that's what the whole lesson six is all about. It's a 45-minute lesson. The other lessons are, are shorter, or 10 to 15 minutes. This one is a full 45 minute lesson. Again, all the curriculum is there. So uh, David and Melech, we've already done in lessons one through five. That's why there's no <laughs> link there. Yehuda Maccabi would be a video uh, on Yehuda Maccabi. This one is 1948. We're going to watch this one. I called you back from the desert because things are not going well. Egyptian tanks have been stopped. 
You've got Jaffa, Haifa, Aiken. Don't worry. Things aren't so bad. Thank you. You've been a disaster. Terrible disaster. The Arab Legion has moved into the fortress. The trying to cut the only supply road to Jerusalem. The Arab Legion? The boys tried to break through yesterday and were slaughtered like cattle. We feel they're irrigated with their blood. That's a real defense minister's speech. Now what happened? Hardly any artillery, not enough men, but most important of all, no centralized leadership. That's right. We have no high command, we have a committee. I know about the ceasefire. The United Nations requested a general truce to go into effect the morning of June 11th. You've accepted? We don't want to see any more bloodshed on either side. Well, but the Arabs have accepted. No, you can't break through to Jerusalem in that way. When the ceasefire comes, the lines will be frozen. The city will have to surrender or be starved to death. We have two weeks. Less. But we've been over all this. What the hell's so important about Jerusalem, militarily? Half the city's already fallen. Look, it just doesn't make sense to risk everything you've got just to save the other half. Did it make sense for a fellow with a nice, steady job building pyramids to march his friends into the Red Sea? <laughs> Jerusalem is starving. Three pieces of bread a week for the children, almost no water. Jerusalem was destroyed once by Nebuchadnezzar, a second time by Titus of Rome. Not again, Mickey, not again. Without Jerusalem, there is no Israel. Anybody recognize that movie? Yes. Shadow. There we go. So that's why I work with Stan, because he helps me find things like this. <laughs> I didn't question those numbers that come up. That shows that there's a video link connected to it, the one, the two, the three. Yes, the way so thing. Camilla has no video. Well, we, uh, yeah, we actually, <laughs> we made one. Remember, this is lesson uh, six. Okay. okay, so lessons one through five were about David Hamel. Got it. And there were videos in there about, okay. about, about his choice of Yerushalayim. Gotcha. As a capital. We will give out also information. We have information about all seven. This is like a write-up about all seven lessons, if you want, and how to um, access the information. So the students have already learned about David, why he chose it as his capital, what was he thinking militarily, uh, spiritually, um, in terms of water, water was a big source in those days. So we've already gone through that. You haven't, but the students have in lessons one through uh, six. This is lesson seven. Who else fought for Jerusalem? Why? Why was it important? And one of the questions we even ask them is an open-ended question. Who else fought for Jerusalem? And everyone posts their answer and everybody sees. And anything they know is welcome and accepted. And yes, let's guess. It has been. It's a timeless battle. Who's fighting for Jerusalem now? We can certainly do a lot of that in our classrooms. And we are trying to get stir up that controversy. So we have a, a video about Yuda Maccabi. We have a video here about David ben Gurion, which you just saw. Some of you was new information. It was new when Stan found it for me. And then we have a video about 1967. After they see these three videos, what do they do? We want feedback. We don't just want watching videos. We go to number four. Number four is a Google form. Oh, sorry. Number four is another Padlet. And this is very controversial because we like controversy, because then it gets kids thinking. So again, you can go and click on number four, assuming you've watched the other three videos, which I'm going to assume you haven't now. But if you really want me to play one, I have six minutes left, so we could technically. Uh, or you could go on and look at the controversial subjects we have here. And again, this curriculum is similar to Rabbi Foreman's. You can take what you like, you can skip what you don't. You don't have to do all of it, but it all comes in seven lessons. So take a look here at what kids have wrote. This again went all over the world, went to schools, and you can scroll down. Um, and it has directions on number one. And you just press the plus over here, and you can write. Also, you can write questions. We left the column for questions. Comments, thoughts, feedback, controversy, yeah. Like, how, how schools have used it? In other words, these are seven lessons in the middle of a, of a year-long shmuel event. Like, what are like, some different ways schools have used it? So some people say, we, uh, we piloted this around the time of Yom Yerushalayim when the embassy was being moved. So most schools did it then, the pilot that went out to hundreds of schools. They took, all, they took out time in the regular Navi class, and they did this for... I don't know that they use it in Navi. In other oh, words, they use it. It could be used if you want to study in Yerushalayim. That would be, you know, a good number of lessons related to Navi mm -hmm. Yerushalayim. And then there's another lesson exactly. after this, which is Yerushalayim and our own life mm -hmm. in Tefillah and Zechah uh, and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
So, so that's where that's when it came out. Uh, and a lot of schools use it like that. It's designed to be used when you're teaching as a blended learning lesson. So you're teaching the, the text in class, and it's and it's a, a companion to that. It's enrichment. It gives you a lot of capability both for homework or for in class use, and uh, as as a point of discussion. It's not completely asynchronous. A lot of the things that we deal with are supposed to create discussion. And a few schools wrote back saying, um, I'd love to do this, but not now. I'm doing Shmuel Bet next October. Can I do it then? So, of course, we'll be in touch, and of course, we can do it. So, we had a few. So, and we sent it out free, uh, Yom Yerushalayim time. Now, there's a $69 charge for all seven lessons, which is not very much. Uh, yeah. So just to clarify, you know, Jess does teacher training on these Padlets and other stuff. That's like one part of it. And then you make some blended learning lessons that you sell. This is a blended learning unit on Jerusalem, the city that unites, or King David critical decisions. So it was called Jerusalem, the city that unites, Yom Yerushalayim time. Now we adjusted it a little bit, and now it's called King David Parshiot Drachim, critical decisions, really focusing on David's life and the critical decisions he made, one of which was moving the capital. And we have other blended learning courses. We have training for teachers. You want to learn how to do this yourself? Fantastic, take our No Teacher Left Behind course. You want this one as a resource, kind of like a guide to keep you, oh, let me think of new ideas, how can I use this one? So this one is $69. This we partnered with Herzog College. They provided the, uh, the initial groundbreaking for this. And now it's, uh, you could buy one for you, you could buy yeah, one per the class. Answer to, the answer to the question though is we do not it's have a, more a bank. bank. We do not have a, a bank. bank. But we're happy we're to, to if you know people <laughs> who want to sponsor <laughs> it, then we are very start. happy we're to do that. <laughs> We don't have a bank of But we're happy to develop as many uh, sponsors as we get. <laughs> we're very good at it. Yeah. Can you just review the functionality of each of these three apps that you showed us, the Padlet, the Fold Everywhere, or Anywhere, or whatever it's called, and Singles? Just the functionality of <coughs> The technical how to's? What they or are. What they, what are. they are. Okay, a Padlet would be considered a collaborative learning tool okay. because students can, every student can post, and you see what every student posts. So, Pardon? They can react to each other. And they react to each other. So usually questions I get from is? How do you monitor? There we go. No one teaches seventh grade boys. Come on. Okay. We have We're girls. It's just Girls. Just as bad. Yeah, and I've heard it's seventh grade and beyond. And I have, I own all of those ages, so I can attribute, yes, it is just as bad. Um, there are features in Padlet, and again, during the webinars, we go into technicalities. Is there a moderation tool that you can turn on? Yes, there is. Do I recommend it? It's really up to you. You decide your students, your classroom, your etiquette and netiquette, things like that. So this would be called collaborative learning. Uh, I do want to call your attention to the way you can answer. You have, if you press right now, do this with me, please. If you press on that plus sign and you press on those three little dots over here, you can do all of these features as well. And one of the pushbacks that we try and give in our training is reading and writing is great. And we do that in our classrooms. But what about all these things? Can we ask our students to draw? Please do that now, try it yourself. Can we ask our students to record themselves dramatically, becoming a character of what they're learning? Can we ask our students to film themselves, to take a selfie? What is going on here with the image? This is the language and this is the culture that they have. Their phones are connected to their bodies. They see it as a natural extension of their bodies. So if we honor that and just bring it into the classroom, the Jewish classroom can also become uh, interactive in that way. So please go ahead and, and play with this. So that is. I mean, if you want to draw David's reaction, you want to draw the world, you want to draw whatever you want. Okay? Please. And I can write my name. What is this? This is a. This is my feeling about Jerusalem. What is it? I'll tell you later. Uh, poll everywhere is a way to interact with your classroom, but you don't get lengthy responses. You get shorter responses only by polls. And thing link, you can link things. You can link videos, you can link forms, you can link padlets, you can link anything you want. You can link research. Read this article. Take a picture of yourself demonstrating how you feel when you read the article. Now record yourself uh, becoming a character uh, from the article and post it all here. So all of these have many, many uses. Uh, that's what you do as a teacher. Two minutes. Other questions? Well, she wants the other I just said them. I just said it. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, other questions about how to use this or the curriculum? Very happy to address 
uh, any of your needs. If not, we can look at more things. No question? Okay. Okay, so um, you can play with it. Yes, this was fast. And again, my apologies for it being fast because I was told to be fast. So we have these, uh, these you want to give out. This is the write up on the. Well, I can just pass them around. Um, our information, our contact information is on the handout that I gave you. It has, it has my email up here uh, for additional information. Uh, and if you can also click this, that has, if you press for information on this document, that is the, uh, on our site, this is how you can get to it. But it's small bet only. Right now, it's small bet and David Hamelach. If you're doing anything that's related to David Hamelach, it's recommended. If you're doing Bereshit, and what's your not next so appropriate. Project? Our next project is our I'm next <laughs> sponsor. <laughs> Sponsors, welcome. Yeah, okay. our next project is to uh, find as many people as we can to use this one to train more teachers to learn how to do this yourself. This is where education is going. Right. So you can say I'm not using technology so in the this classroom. Is really a Your goal is not to create a Yehoshua, a Shof team. I would love to. But I can't wow. do it without I funding. Wanna, you, or, or do you want us to create? Do you, do you want to train people so that you they can create? Both. Or, oh, Both. Okay, got absolutely, it. absolutely. I think you are all amazing teachers. I want to empower you to do this in your own classrooms. Gotcha. Right? And then if you want us to do it for you, because this is a team of five to seven people working on this for three months. Right. You can't expect one teacher or even two teachers in one classroom to do that. It's not reasonable. Teachers are very busy people. We want to honor your time. We want to make your classroom experience a more viable, engaging, interactive place. You can lean on people like Herzog and Jets working together to make your classroom a more enriching place. Do you need to be, um, be able to use technology a little bit to do that? Great. A little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Have Thanks. a good Thanks. day. Thanks.